May 1941, the cold waters of the Atlantic. The flagship of the Royal Navy, the mighty battlecruiser HMS Hood, the pride of the entire nation, disappears in a ball of fire in three minutes. Of the nearly 1,500 crew members, only three survive. And this was not just a tragic accident. It was the price that had to be paid for decades of engineering compromises. British battleships, from the hood to the newest ships of the King George class, seemed like indestructible steel giants, the crown jewels of naval engineering. But behind their majestic facades and formidable artillery lay fundamental flaws. The compromises made by designers and doctrines that were outdated before the first shot was fired turned these leviathans into surprisingly fragile targets. This is a story of how overconfidence, budget constraints, and misjudgment of future threats nearly cost Britain its dominance at sea. At the beginning of the 20th century, a nation's power was measured by the caliber of its guns and the thickness of its ship's armor. And in this race, Britain was unrivaled. The phrase, Britain, rule the seas, was not an empty slogan. It was a reality, backed up by dozens of dreadnoughts. After the Battle of Jutland in 1916, it seemed that the doctrine of the battleship fleet had proven itself. The future was seen in artillery duels between giants, where the winner would be the one who could deliver and withstand the most devastating blows. It was with this mindset that ship design approached the interwar period. However, the world was changing rapidly. The Washington Naval Treaty of 1922, designed to stop the arms race, imposed strict restrictions on the displacement of new battleships, no more than 35,000 tons. For designers, this was a ruthless triangle of compromises, speed, armament, or protection. Improving one parameter inevitably led to the weakening of another. The British Admiralty, bound by treaties and limited in budget, time and again made choices that seemed logical on paper but proved fatal in reality. They continued to build ships for the previous war. The main focus was on protection against medium-range fire, a scenario that had been tested at Jutland. The threat from the air was considered secondary, and the possibility of a ship being hit by a bomb dropped from an aircraft was considered highly unlikely. Long-range artillery capable of firing shells on a high trajectory that could penetrate thin deck armor was also not considered a major threat. As a result, ships that were the embodiment of an illusion were born on the slipways. Huge and well-armed, they carried an aura of invincibility. The King George V-class battleships were the pinnacle of this philosophy. With 10 356mm guns and a powerful armor belt, they looked like the perfect naval duelists. But their strength was concentrated only in certain areas, leaving huge sections dangerously vulnerable. They were like a knight in magnificent armor who forgot to wear his helmet. And World War II became the tournament where this miscalculation was exploited with ruthless efficiency. To understand why the British giants proved so fragile, we need to look at their design and examine three key elements where fatal mistakes were made. Armor, anti-aircraft armament, and underwater protection. During the interwar period, the American all-or-nothing armor system became dominant. The idea is simple and logical. It is impossible to protect the entire ship with thick armor without exceeding displacement limits. Therefore, the armor was concentrated in one place, creating an armored citadel inside which were located vital compartments, artillery magazines, engines, and control stations. Everything else, the bow, stern, and superstructures, remained virtually unprotected. The British adopted this concept but implemented it in their own way, based on the same Jutland doctrine. They saw enemy shells flying in a flat trajectory as the main threat. Therefore, battleships of the King George V class received an extremely powerful main armor belt, up to 381 mm thick, one of the thickest in the world. It was capable of withstanding the impact of almost any shell from the distances of a classic naval battle. But this protection came at a price. 
To save weight, the deck armor was made dangerously thin. The main armored deck above the magazines was up to 152 millimeters thick, and above the engine rooms it was even thinner, about 127 millimeters. The designers reasoned that for a shell to penetrate the deck, it would have to be fired from a very long distance, which was unlikely in the poor visibility conditions of the North Sea. This was the first miscalculation. First, by the end of the 1930s, long-range combat had become a reality. Enemy shells falling at a steep angle turned into deadly mines that could easily penetrate the thin British deck. Second, and most importantly, the designers catastrophically underestimated aviation. An aerial bomb dropped from a height of several kilometers did not follow a flat trajectory. It always fell almost vertically, and 152 millimeters of armor was completely insufficient to protect against a heavy armor-piercing bomb. In essence, every British battleship had an Achilles heel the size of a football field, its entire deck. If the problem with armor was a consequence of outdated doctrine, then the weakness of air defense was the result of a tragic underestimation of the new threat. In the 1920s and 1930s, many admirals still considered aircraft to be nothing more than annoying reconnaissance tools. This mentality led to the creation of AD systems that looked good on paper but were ineffective in combat. The British Navy's main hope was the versatile 133mm guns on the King George V-class battleships. The idea was advanced, to create a gun capable of fighting both destroyers and aircraft equally effectively. In practice, the result was a monster that performed poorly at both tasks. Its shells were too light to fight ships, and the whole system was too slow to fight aircraft. In practice, the rate of fire rarely exceeded 7 to 8 rounds per minute per barrel, which was half that of similar American systems. The turrets rotated painfully slowly, unable to keep up with maneuverable torpedo bombers. The second line of defense was the famous 8-barreled, 40mm pom-pom automatic cannons. In theory, the wall of fire from these installations was supposed to shoot down any aircraft, but here too, reality proved cruel. The pom-poms had a low initial projectile velocity, which meant a short effective range. The aircraft had to be allowed to get very close. But the main problem lay in their capricious mechanisms, which often jammed after a few short bursts. Their effectiveness proved to be depressingly low. The British relied on complex but unreliable systems, missing what the Americans later realized. The best air defense is a multitude of simple and reliable small-caliber automatic weapons, such as the Bofors and Orlikan. The anti-torpedo protection of British ships also had hidden flaws. On King George's fifth-class battleships, a complex system of alternating empty and liquid-filled compartments was designed to absorb the energy of a torpedo explosion. However, its effectiveness was greatly reduced when the ship was listing, and improper operation could only exacerbate the consequences of a hit. Older ships were even more vulnerable. Their internal layout with long longitudinal bulkheads along the engine rooms could play a cruel joke. Instead of limiting flooding to a single compartment, it could lead to the flooding of a huge space along the entire side of the ship, causing a rapid and uncontrollable list. But the most frightening hidden threat was the vulnerability of the artillery magazines. The memory of the explosions of three British battlecruisers in the Battle of Jutland seemed to have taught designers once and for all to provide maximum protection for the magazines. But compromises related to weight and weak deck armor once again created a deadly danger. As history has shown, this problem was not completely solved. Theoretical weaknesses remained on paper until the first shots were fired. World War II turned engineering debates into brutal reality, where every mistake was paid for with lives. So, on May 24, 1941, in the Danish Straits, a British squadron led by the battlecruiser HMS Hood engaged in battle with the German battleship Bismarck. 
Hood was a symbol of the empire, but its elegant silhouette concealed an inherent flaw. Designed during World War I, it had dangerously thin deck armor. The battle began at a great distance, about 23 kilometers. This was precisely the scenario that the British considered unlikely. The shells flew in a steep, arcing trajectory. The Bismarck's fifth salvo proved fatal. One of the shells hit its target. Eyewitnesses saw a giant column of flame, followed by a monstrous explosion that tore the ship in half. It was all over in three minutes. Of the 1,418 people on board, only three survived. Analysis showed that the German shell most likely pierced the thin deck armor and caused the stern artillery magazines to detonate. The loss of the hood was not just a misfortune, it was a disaster made possible by its design vulnerabilities. The pride of the nation was destroyed by a single lucky hit. If the loss of the hood demonstrated vulnerability to artillery, the defeat of Force Z demonstrated the complete inadequacy of British air defense. In December 1941, a squadron led by the battlecruiser Repulse and the newest battleship Prince of Wales was sent to Singapore. The latter was a representative of the King George V class, which seemed to have taken all the lessons learned into account. Admiral Tom Phillips believed that a fast maneuvering battleship could not be sunk by aircraft, and on December 10th, he took the ships out to sea without fighter cover. This decision was a death sentence. Soon they were attacked by dozens of Japanese torpedo bombers and bombers. Immediately, all the shortcomings of the air defense system became apparent. The Prince of Wales' heavy 133mm turrets could not keep up with the targets. The pom-poms either jammed or their shells simply did not reach the aircraft. The Japanese pilots, encountering almost no resistance, attacked as if they were in a training exercise. The repulse was hit by several torpedoes and sank quickly. The fate of the Prince of Wales was even more instructive. One of the first torpedoes hit the stern, damaging the propeller shaft. Spinning, it destroyed several bulkheads, causing massive flooding. The ship lost speed and power, becoming a helpless target that the Japanese only had to finish off. The loss of two battleships from air attacks came as a shock. It proved that the era of battleships without air cover was over. The third act of the tragedy was captured on film. On November 25, 1941, the battleship Barham, a veteran of Jutland, was sailing in the Mediterranean Sea. Suddenly, it was attacked by the German submarine U-331. Three torpedoes hit the same area on the port side. The consequences were immediate. The ship began to list rapidly. And just as the Barham was about to capsize, its stern gun turrets detonated. A giant fireball and column of smoke shot up hundreds of meters into the air. 862 crew members were killed. The loss of the Barham exposed the final vulnerability, the inability of old designs to withstand concentrated underwater strikes, and the old, still unresolved problem of magazine safety. The loss of the Hood, the defeat of Force Z, and the destruction of the Baram were not isolated tragedies, but symptoms of a deeper disease. The British school of shipbuilding suffered from pride based on past successes. Designers created magnificent ships for battles that would never take place. The fundamental miscalculation was an incorrect assessment of the threats, long-range artillery, and most importantly, aviation. Admirals refused to believe until the very end that aircraft could become the main enemy of battleships. And the Washington Treaty pushed designers into dangerous compromises, forcing them to economize on the most important things, deck armor and anti-aircraft guns. However, it would be wrong to say that these miscalculations cost Britain its fleet. Yes, the Royal Navy suffered terrible losses, but it managed to learn its lessons. The remaining ships were urgently modernized. They were literally showered with dozens of rapid-fire 20mm Ehrlichons and 40mm Beaufort's. Doctrines changed. No large ship went to sea without reliable fighter cover. Gradually, aircraft carriers, rather than battleships, became the center of naval formations. 
Battleships such as the Duke of York and the Anson served with distinction until the end of the war, but they survived largely because the Navy learned to compensate for their weaknesses, acting on the bitter lessons learned. The history of British battleship engineering miscalculations is an instructive parable about the dangers of preparing for the last war. It shows that even the thickest armor and the largest guns are powerless if they protect against the wrong threats. The majestic dreadnoughts, once symbols of the Empire's indestructible power, turned out to be giants with feet of clay and their fiery demise marked not the end of the Royal Navy, but the end of an entire era, an era when the battleship was king of the ocean. That throne has now passed to aircraft carriers for good. If you enjoyed this dive into the history of naval technology, subscribe to the channel, and be sure to write in the comments what other engineering solutions, successful or failed, you would like to hear about in future videos. It is your ideas that help us choose the most interesting topics.